One of the world's greatest stories is the doubling of human life expectancy over the last 150 years. That was accomplished primarily through control and prevention of infectious diseases, and in particular, the prevention of early childhood deaths. Today, as a result of that progress in the United States and many other countries, children that are born today are 85% of them are expected to live to 65 years of age. At least 42% of those same children will celebrate an 85th birthday. But like many of the themes that we've been discussing over the last day, great success often reveals fundamental new challenges. And this is certainly the case with human health. Because right now, the most daunting and expensive human health problem that increasingly the entire globe is facing is age-related chronic diseases. And our hypothesis at Human Longevity is that genomics and the technologies that support its application in medicine and drug discovery are going to be the next accelerant in extending high-performance human lifespan. So about three years ago, we recognized that several trends came together in a fairly unique way that allowed genomics to be scaled for the first time. First, there was a radical decrease in the cost of whole genome sequencing. This is a 3.2 billion um, um, uh, data point code that actually runs in all of your 30 trillion cells. The first map of this genome cost about $3 billion to produce. Um, we are now down, 15 years later, to about $1,000 and about $3,000 if you include the analytic component. So um, about five to six orders of magnitude in decreased cost. But that was not the only trend um, or the only thing that needed to happen to scale genomics. The other important ingredients to make this moment possible is the availability of large-scale compute power. Um, this exists today in the form of cloud computing. And it's just barely adequate at this point to begin to host this voluminous data and allow us to manipulate and analyze it. Um, the third trend is the mainstream um, adoption of machine learning. This particular kind of artificial intelligence for the first time makes it possible to analyze and interpret these data. The last is the trend that you're probably most familiar with, the transition from volume-based healthcare to value-based healthcare. I titled my talk from synthetic life to human longevity, because as was mentioned, Craig Venter, my associate and founder of Human Longevity, was the first person to sequence the full human genome back in 2000. But he actually did something else in 2010 that was just as important, perhaps more important. So Craig took the available science and sat down at a computer with the notion that he could actually design a genome, a sequence of DNA letters, produce that genome artificially, insert it into a membrane, and boot up life from scratch. He was successful in doing that, which confirms something that's fairly uh, spectacular. Um, and that is that all of life, including humans, is an organic algorithm that's animated by this DNA code. And what we are about to embark on is hacking the software of life, basically for the first time trying to understand all the instructions that build, operate, and reproduce us as humans. So at Human Longevity, our sole focus is to predict everything that can be predicted 
from that whole genome sequence. And we think it's going to be much more than most people believe or suspect at this point. But it's not a trivial enterprise because if you look at the genome in isolation, it's not very useful. So what we are really in the business of doing is building integrated health records. We're in the business of building a large database that includes the whole genome sequence as the anchor for these records, but also includes very detailed, high-quality clinical data that we can use to correlate with the genome. So in essence, we are engaging in a very large scale, probably the largest scale um, enterprise ever, in translation. We are translating the language of biology in the form of linear DNA code into the language of health and disease. And our notion is that building a platform that can do that at scale will drive tremendous innovation and progress in life science. It will drive tremendous progress in life and health insurance. And it will drive tremendous progress in healthcare delivery by powering a next generation of health and healthcare models. So we've built the infrastructure to engage in this translation enterprise. The world-class sequencing capability, which is still a little bit of an art form, the um, bioinformatics platform hosted on the Amazon cloud, we're one of Amazon's largest customers um, after only 40,000 whole genome sequences, which is larger by an order of magnitude than the entire global inventory of deep whole genome sequences. We've established our ma machine learning capability, but most importantly, we've also established and are running a clinical integration platform, a medical services platform called the Health Nucleus. And we did this for two reasons. One was that whenever you're trying to begin to engage physicians to think differently about a new opportunity in medicine, uh, my experience is that you have to build the thing you're talking about. So the Health Nucleus gave us the opportunity to build a prototype for what we think the future of health and healthcare will look like. The second reason we did this is, is perhaps a little bit more uh, nuanced and important, though, is that although there's lots of clinical data available in the world, none of it is ideally suited for combining with the whole genome sequence for clinical purposes as well as discovery purposes. So in building the health nucleus, building this clinical integration platform, we made a big bet. We made a bet that going forward, the most powerful complement to whole genome sequencing for clinical care and clinical discovery is likely to be advanced imaging technology. In particularly, um, uh, the magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, for a number of reasons. It's made almost as much progress in the last 15 years as sequencing, um, but also it doesn't expose people to dangerous radiation, and we don't use it with contrast, so it's free of medical risk. But very importantly, it allows the exploration of the major body systems that are associated with premature mortality. And we focused our efforts on those conditions that are causing premature deaths among people that are 50 to 74 years of, years of age. And it's very interesting. Everyone sort of thinks they're going to live to average life expectancy of late 70s, early 80s. But actually, in the United States, the cumulative risk of mortality between 50 and 74 years of age in men is 39%. So 39% of men don't make it through that life, that life period. For women, it's a little less at about 24%. And those diseases are, that actually cause deaths are well known. This is cardiovascular disease. This is cancer, diabetes, neurologic disease, liver disease, and respiratory disease. 
These are the things that are killing members of your family and community now. These are the urgent priorities. And we are confident, and in fact, we're just publishing our first science paper um, uh, describing our early experience in the health nucleus and suggesting that by combining whole genome sequencing with imaging um, and a variety of other things that we can, can detect um, and predict the occurrence of disease in ways that will limit that premature mortality. I don't think that's the end, though, because in the process of doing this, uh, not only are we going to get more people to um, the average life expectancy and beyond, but our belief is that we are also going to identify root causes of aging. And my timeline is, is perhaps a little different than Aubrey's. Um, I think that we, um, we 50-year-old, 60-year-old people are in a position to benefit um, from some of this science, but our children, mine are 21 and 24, are very likely to benefit not only from the extension of, of, of uh, longevity to out to the human species um, uh, uh, limit, uh, current limit, but actually beyond. So I think my children, as a result of this technology, are, are quite likely to live one or two or three decades in better health as a result of the kinds of discoveries that we're making. I will close by suggesting that one of the implications of what we're doing is also um, um, uh, quite revolutionary, and that is as a result of genomics creating a bow wave to move to big data in health and healthcare, we are going to transform medicine from a clinical science supported by data to a data science supported by clinicians. And this is going to be a profound um, disruption in our current format for the practice of medicine where we actually rely on physicians to be the computers that pull all this data together and, and use it on our behalf. That's not going to be possible in the place that we're going very shortly as a result of genomics. So thank you all very much. That was really wonderful. Um, and maybe we can have uh, a few minutes of conversation and then we'll, we'll open it up uh, to, uh, to questions. Of course, it's an incredible, an incredible vision and incredibly exciting. And I think it's all the more powerful made by the fact that the way you outlined it, it's perhaps going to have a little impact on us, but it's really for our children. So that kind of, that kind of um, forward thinking, of course, in, you're in the business model. I, it must have been the case that you uh, discussed the fact that as much of the genome da data that is now needed to be able to develop the database, you need this phenotypic data. We discussed this slightly yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And, and I guess my provocative question is, did you ever discuss how could we make this nucleus, this health nucleus, available to a huge number of people? During the, during the years of analysis and, and developing a database, therefore making it yeah. essentially free. <laughs> Yeah, so I appreciate the question, and, and this is one of the uh, things that Fabio picked up when we talked yesterday. The genomics is hard, but it's actually, um, it's a fairly straightforward digital conversion of data. The clinical data, or phenotype, is actually much harder because it's much more complicated, it's much more vast, and getting that organized in a way to query the, the genomics and, and do this translation exercise is, is a bigger challenge. In terms of scaling what we're doing in the health nucleus, um, our intention is to become a health intelligence company. So we're really about being able to provide support to physicians and consumers at large scale. And, and we're building the health nucleus really to help us develop the tools to virtualize everything that we're doing. And in fact, you know, Tommy and I um, at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi have talked about for the last year, you know, when is the right time to begin to virtualize this capability so that anybody can use this technology? Well, I think that's uh, going to be really 
Wonderful. I was just imagining the, the conversations as a business model because the data will be extremely useful as you build your database right. and, and how to make that available. I can appreciate the, the sort of pushing it as fast as possible. The one area you didn't talk about, but maybe it's useful for, for, for people to hear, um, you know, the, the context of the Cynthia, the, the context of developing a synthetic organism that you, 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 you talked about for, from Craig Venter, um, then demonstrating that in fact the DNA is so powerful at developing the system for life. What's not explicit in that conversation is, is the environmental impact of, of right. uh, how we live. And maybe you can describe a little bit how you're approaching that and, and uh, perhaps talk a little tiny bit about uh, the yeah. sort of epigenetic approaches that you might be looking at. Right. Uh, so um, we have, as scientists, for a very long time recognized that genomics is not fate, that, that actually your genomics is very sensitive to um, your environment and your behaviors, and it's really the combination of nature or genomics and nurture, as it's characteristically uh, called, sort of the combination of your environmental influences and your behaviors that, that interact to create um, your risk for, for disease. Um, and we, we think it's gonna be very important, this is really the first op opportunity to pin down the nature part of, of, of health and that by doing that, it's gonna make it much easier to sort out which are the environmental and behavioral components that are most important in interacting with your genomics to, to create health risk. Yeah, and I was actually also getting at the, at the, the fact, so you know, the, the various people that have tried to assess how much the uh, longevity is associated with genetics, they come to about a 25, 30% is genetically encoded. But I would argue that those data miss the potential for what happens at the epigenetic level. And therefore, it could very well be 50 or 60 percent uh, level. And, and that's a measurable, yeah. uh, genome-based yeah. measurable data yeah. point that maybe I, I was wondering whether you are measuring that or whether you plan to measure that. We, we will. And we're already seeing some early indications of that in our first 40,000 uh, genomes because you know, we've never had a large number of whole genome sequences to look at, and it's really, it's the equivalent of, we've been looking around at the genome with a flashlight, and we just flipped on the Hubble telescope, and are seeing the next frontier in biologic diversity. Um, and, and the genome is, is um, highly variable about where it allows changes to occur. And so I think there's a, there's a next frontier in analytics that will get not only to disease risk, but to life extension beyond that 100-year limit that, that we've traditionally. Uh, yeah, had. that's great because, you know, in, in some sense, just to make sure that we, we describe it, the DNA sequence is, is only four letters of, of data. It's just a really very long sequence of over three billion for a haploid genome. But, but the, that sequence is also modified, modified by enzymes that changes it. And that, those modifications actually affect what genes are expressed and what isn't expressed, which essentially gives a possibility for the environment to interact with, with the genetics. Right. And, but you can still read it because we can see those modifications using new t different technologies than a straightforward uh, right. reader. And that's it's really, uh, I think, a, a wonderful uh, frontier. I have sort of two related questions um, that, that follow up on this because, of course, people um, see immediately some other ramifications to this that have to do with security, data security, data use in one way or another, and perhaps the most extreme way of, of, of thinking about this. Uh, and again, I'm going back to the synthetic life aspect of your title. Um, uh, so we have a colleague at NYU that is developing the synthetic yeast, and you may know that, Jeff Buka. Uh, and it's very fascinating to hear him talk about the decisions that are being made in the development of that synthetic genome. They're wanting to make a yeast just like a yeast cell, but they're changing the way the yeast has actually evolved to make, right. the, we could, and they're making them ad hoc, as he says it. I mean, there's no reason why these ribosomal genes have to be scattered, they could put together so it becomes more efficient for us to then mutate them and work with them. So they're making decisions in the synthetic code that then is going to be analyzed as the organism. So, one really um, sort of outlandish, perhaps, um, uh, sort of research 
exploration question is in terms of if you can actually get to a point where you can make a human being by, by creating the code on a computer that gets spit out by a machine and you can take a O site and put it in there, what, what do you see both in the context of the dangers for currently looking at these data in terms of healthcare and, and private data, but also going forward in the long-term future? So one of the things that's happened just within the last three or four years is that we have developed some unique capability to, to edit the, the genome um, with a technology called CRISPR-Cas9 uh, that looks like it's gonna be highly effective. So it's not just simply hacking the code or interpreting the software. We are going to have the capability to begin to rewrite uh, the code um, we think that it's too early to do that for humans, uh, except in exceptional circumstances, because we don't know enough about all the ramifications of doing that um, in the human genome. But, but going further down the line, I, it's likely to become a routine practice, and we're gonna be faced with balancing, uh, as we are with all new technologies, right. um, you know, use for good versus use for evil. And, and um, I think on balance, um, uh, this represents a huge opportunity for humanity, but like we've seen with other technologies, the downside risk is gonna have to be carefully managed and is gonna be a political, social dialogue that I think will be very important for the next and, level. And everyone, yeah. I, mean, I know you're inviting everyone to, to, to be involved Absolutely. in that conversation. And, and of course, the, the, in some sense, immortality is here. When you have decoded the genome, and you can potentially use it uh, to create a new life form, uh, you've created the immortal self, right? So uh, it, is, it is very far reaching, of course, and not in any kind of uh, sort of near future, but those data are stored potentially forever. Uh, so thank you uh, again for a wonderful discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.